Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Most people take their definition of angels from the culture and its books and TV shows. It's far better to define them the way the Bible does. And so today, we'll hear a biblical doctrine of angels as we learn more about the role of Gabriel in the Christmas story. Stay with us. From the Moody Church in Chicago, this is Running to Win with Dr. Erwin Lutzer, whose clear teaching helps us make it across the finish line. Pastor Lutzer, it seems from the Bible that angels exist in a hierarchy of authority. Any idea how many ranks there are? Well, Dave, I can't answer your question specifically, but this we know they are highly organized. That's also true of the evil spirit world, the principalities and the powers. And, of course, we know about the archangel. But this we know, all of the good angels do God's will consistently, all of them bringing glory to the Lord. Well, as we think about Christmas, of course, we always think about angels, but we also have to make spiritual preparation because the brand new year is just around the corner. And this is one of the last days we're making a devotional available to you entitled God's Best for My Life, Daily Inspirations for a Deeper Walk with God. For a gift of any amount, this can be yours. We thank you so much for praying about the possibility of supporting this ministry. But here's the contact info. Go to rtwoffer.com or call us at 1-888-218-9337. And how we thank God for the angels that obey his will. Gabriel was sent by God. Secondly, uh, Gabriel understood God's word. Now let's pick up the text. It says that he said to her, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. Verse 29. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Three things that Gabriel says about Jesus, and then three job descriptions that will involve Jesus. The first is, his name shall be called Jesus, Savior, Yeshua, Messiah. You're going to bear him, Mary. Second, he shall be great, and most assuredly he shall be great, and he shall be the Son of the Most High, which indicates his rank, his position, and even his eternality as the Son of God. So, Mary... Just understand that this is not an ordinary baby. You are going to bear Messiah. And then he goes on to say that he will have a throne, he will have a house, and he will have a kingdom. He will reign over the house of David. Now, I have to ask you, how how do you think Mary understood this? Do you think that she understood this to mean that Jesus was going to rule in heaven? I don't think so. I think think she actually thought that Jesus was going to rule over the territory over which David ruled. That there is a coming kingdom yet on this earth when the law shall go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks and there's going to be a time of peace and prosperity and Jesus is going to rule. I think that's the way in which she understood it. But I want you to know that Gabriel here is quoting Scripture, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 16. And oftentimes passages of Scripture which may not intrigue us may really intrigue angels who are interested in God's purposes and ways in the world. So, so he understands the Word of God and connects 
this word with the birth of the Messiah. And then he understands God's ways because she quite naturally asks him, how shall this be, verse 34, because I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child will be born, who will be born, will be called Holy, the Son of God. Gabriel says, you have to understand something, Mary. We're talking about a God of miracles, a God who can overshadow you. And you don't need, this child does not need a father. One day I was talking to a young man who was pastor of a small church, and he said, I'm going to resign and I'm going to go to university, going to go to seminary. And I said, why? He said, because there was someone in my church who didn't believe in the virgin birth, And so he said, I need to be able to answer how that could come about. I said, well, it's good that you want to go to seminary and university, but I want you to know that you will not discover through your studies how that can come about because that is a miracle that is done by God, and only God knows how he does miracles. Only God knows how he creates. You've heard me say that if you want to be like God, take nothing into the laboratory and and stay there as long as you need to until you create a molecule out of nothing. But like I always say, take your lunch. You're going to be there a very long time. We don't know how God did it. God can do it. And, And today the virgin birth in the minds of some people is optional. You know, it's optional to believe in the virgin birth. There are pastors here in this city who are teaching today at Christmas time that it's optional that you believe in the virgin birth. What they do not understand is it is necessary to our faith because the virgin birth preserves the sinlessness of Jesus. If Jesus had been a sinner, he couldn't be a redeemer because he could not be a part of our predicament and redeem us. And so his sinlessness had to be preserved. And so it was a miraculous conception. And uh, Gabriel understands this and says uh, to her, I love verse 37, for nothing will be impossible with God. We're not dealing here with human medical limitations. Nothing is going to be impossible with God. And Mary says, behold, behold the servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel, Gabriel, departs from her. Can't you imagine him going back to heaven and giving a report and saying, God, just want you to know, mission accomplished, right woman, right message, right answer. It's all been done. And Gabriel awaits his next assignment. Now, as you stop to think of it, when Joseph was told about this, he did have a dream and an angel did appear to him in the dream because God willed it so. And so it may have been the same angel. Maybe it was Gabriel, though the angel's name is not given to us. I'd like to take these thoughts today and and help us have three transforming lessons that we need to learn more broadly from the whole doctrine, the biblical doctrine of angels. First of all, the ministry of angels is limited to God's people. It's limited to God's people. Hebrews 1.14, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who shall be heirs of salvation? Angels protect us, they guard us, and they will meet us at death. You remember when the rich man died, he went into Hades. But when Lazarus, the poor man, died, he was carried by angels into Abraham's bosom. I would think that at the death of a Christian, though they are usually invisible, angels are there to escort the person, the soul, into the very presence of Almighty God. Now, how do angels minister to us? Uh, Sometimes maybe invisibly, invisibly, sometimes visibly, and they take the appearance of a person, the appearance of a man. And, and, And events may happen... Events may happen on earth that, that we look back and we say, you know, maybe I met an angel because even the angels of Scripture, it says some have entertained them unawares. When Abraham had three angels and they came to him and he actually fed them and they ate 
with him. So, so it may well be that sometimes they appear as people. And you have these strange occurrences. I think of a car accident in Canada where three, three Christians were killed. The driver, uh, his life was spared. Actually, he was driving along and hit ice and a great van came, great semi-truck, killed three people. It was said by witnesses that after the accident, for a few moments, there was a man who was at the vicinity of the car who later on disappeared and was seen no more. I don't know, but I wonder if it could be an angel at the scene of an accident. Would you like to hear a, an angel story that Rebecca and I have had? I'm not sure absolutely that it was angels, but we have no other explanation for what happened to us. One day when we were newly married, about 1971 or so, we were on our way to Canada for Christmas. We crossed the U.S. border into that uh, tundra called Saskatchewan. Cold, blowing wind, maybe zero degrees, high wind, snow. We drove a mile or two on the other side of the border on the highway and uh, virtually no traffic and the car begins to swerve. And I notice that uh, something obviously is wrong and I get out. I'm not dressed very well, certainly not dressed for that weather discover that we have a flat tire on the back. The tire is flat. As I say, we were not dressed well. We should have known better. Now, what is it that you do? We thought about it for a moment, and on a side road, on a side road, now these are the kinds of roads that farmers use a couple times a year, you understand. This is not highly traveled. On a side road, a car is coming very, very slowly. We see its lights. It turns right beside us. The window rolls down, and uh, the man says, uh, you know, can we help you? I said, yeah, I have a flat. They said, you stay in the car. We're going to change it for you. I said, who are you? And they said, oh, we're just going around looking for people to help like you. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's fine. Now, you know when, when you have a flat tire and, and you're driving... And, and you're on your way to somewhere. There's suitcases in the back, and they all have to be taken out. Now, you have to understand, I'm the kind of person who doesn't know which end to pick up a screwdriver with, you know. <laughs> and uh, I could probably change a flat tire on a real nice sunny day with daylight, and uh, if I began early in the morning, it would probably be changed by night. <laughs> Maybe. So these men go to work. As they are finishing up, I do go out of the car and go to the back to thank them. I want to pay them. Oh, no, 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 no. You know, we're just, we're just here to help you. All right, fine. Thank you very, very much. Now, as we are leaving to drive onto the highway, we look in the rearview mirror, and what do we expect? We expect these people to continue on on the highway because, after all, they, they were just going. This was just a nice juxtaposition of events. What they do is they turn around on the highway and then they go back that same old country road and disappear in the distance. Where in the world did those guys come from, and where in the world did they go? If they weren't angels, all that I can say is, we sure, we sure had the protection and the guidance of a sovereign God in some way. But you know... <laughs> So angels are sent to help people. Yesterday, someone in the church I told this story to, and she said that when she was walking in a very dangerous place in Chicago, she met a man who seemed to be very unique, nicely dressed, who warned her, don't go in this direction, go in that direction, and she just took it as the direction of God. Again, maybe we can't be sure, but the Bible says that they are ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who are heirs of salvation. And if we had time, we could look at the way in which angels minister to Jesus. When he's there in the desert and he's, he's hungry and he's weak, angels come and they minister to him after his confrontation with Satan. And you think of many stories. One more from a friend of ours who's uh, written a book, and I won't go into the details. It's not a book about angels. It was just thrown in. She was in an airport in Eastern Europe and didn't know where to go and didn't have the right papers to leave the country when it was under communism. And a very well-dressed man came to her and said to her, 
I know the papers that you need. Get into the car with me and we'll go get them. She never met him before, no conversations. Now, normally, a woman should never get in the car with a man, but she felt so confident that this man was right that she went. He went, picked up the papers, and they came back to the airport. He helped her there with her luggage, and she turned to thank him, and he was gone. Never did see him. Angels, ministering spirits. You say, well, do they ever minister to the unsaved? Well, I do know this, that the Bible is very clear that angels do perform a function to those who do not know Christ as Savior, but unfortunately, according to the book of Revelation, it is a function of judgment. You have Jesus returning from heaven in flaming fire and his holy angels taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. These angels are not out there doing all kinds of miracles for anyone, no matter what you believe. God sovereignly may help those, but let's remember that they are sent forth as ministers, ministers to those who are heirs of salvation. These are God's holy angels. So, first of all, angels, their ministry is limited to God's people. And, of course, there are miracles that fallen angels do, too, you understand. So, some of the angel stories undoubtedly are true, even though they may be performed by the wrong side of the spirit world. Secondly, angels, I believe, and we're talking about the holy angels, they have a particular interest in redemption, a particular interest in redemption. And we can understand why. Here they were with their colleagues, and uh, a man by the name of Lucifer decided to keep some of the glory to himself. Evidently, he was a choir master. He had the responsibility of, of getting glory and, and making sure that all the glory in the universe was going to God, and he began to keep some back. He began to hold some to himself, and that began, of course, the whole chain of sin. And if we read Revelation correctly, if it is true that a third of the angels fell, you can understand now that the other two-thirds are saying, wow, our colleagues fell into disobedience, and they are going to be in hell forever, and there can be no redemption for them. Absolutely not. You say, well, what if they wanted to be redeemed? They could not be redeemed because there was no sacrifice made for them. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, he took not upon himself the form of angels. He took upon himself the form of the seed of Abraham to redeem us. He had to become like those whom he redeems. So now the angels are beginning to see that we fell really as far as Satan did in our rebellion. And now God is going to remain just and become the justifier of those who believe in Jesus. And, and this intrigues them, I believe, greatly. That's why they desire to look into these things. And then the fact that we shall be exalted above them and have privileges that they could never possibly have because we're brothers and sisters of Jesus, which they can never be because they're ontologically different, all of that, I think, holds their fascination. And so angels, angels observe today the church. There's a passage in 1 Corinthians that says, uh, speaking about the order of the way in which things should be done for the church, it says uh, you should do this because of the angels because they're watching our worship and are very interested in God's redemption. So much so that when, an, when a sinner repents, there are angels in heaven that rejoice. Wouldn't it be wonderful this morning if the angels would rejoice because someone at the Moody Church repented and received Christ as Savior? And then finally, we admire angels we admire them, but we never worship them. Never invite them into our dreams. If God wants to send an angel to give you a dream, let God make that decision. When we open our lives, there are other angels out there, as I mentioned, who may take advantage of our naivete. And, and listen to this passage of Scripture from John. Now, if we saw an angel, if an angel walked into this church... If an angel came in today, the first temptation that you and I would have was to bow before it. If we saw it in its glistening beauty and purity and strength and power, we, we'd be tempted to fall down. That's what John did in 
Revelation chapter 22, he hears this revelation from an angel. And I, John, am one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book. Worship God, the angel says. When you go into a New Age bookstore, you have all these people who are fascinated with angels. What we need to be reminded of is worship God and come to God through his Son which is the only way that the worship can be received by him. Angels can be admired, but they're never, never to be worshipped. Our hearts belong to God alone. Let's pray together. Our Father, we want to thank you so much for angels. Thank you for Gabriel. Thank you for Michael, who contends with those angels that fell. Thank you, Father, that you sent forth ministering spirits to us and that because of this, we have the assurance that uh, we are never alone. You're always with us and your angels as well. Help us in this age of confusion. And for those who have never trusted Christ as Savior, they've never reached out and believed on him, cause them to do that today, we pray. In fact, if you have not believed on Christ, could I speak to you now and say, whoever you are listening, at this moment say, Jesus, I receive you as mine. I receive your cleansing and your forgiveness. I desire to be reconciled to you. And now, Father, I speak to you again as Father, as God, as Lord. For those of us who know you, we pray that this Christmas season might be one of great joy and the opportunity to share with others the warmth of the Father's home and the forgiveness of the Father's love, we pray in Jesus' blessed name. Amen. Amen. You know, you'd be surprised at the number of people who like to be fascinated with angels because they think that surely angels are more accessible than God. But of course, that's a deception. Well, we have Christmas just around the corner. And of course, after Christmas comes the new year. Have you made spiritual preparation for January 1st, beginning then? Well, we have a devotional for you. And this is one of the last days that we are making it available. It's entitled, God's Best for My Life. Daily Inspirations for a Deeper Walk with God. Of course, you need contact info. Here's what you can do. Go to rtwoffer.com. Of course, rtwoffer is all one word. Or you can pick up the phone and call us at 1-888-218-9337. Now, because this is a matter of some urgency... One of the last days, as I've mentioned, that we are making this resource available, I'm going to be giving you that contact info again. But thank you so much for your prayers and for your support of this ministry. We do not take it for granted. But as you think about the new year, think of the devotional, God's Best for My Life. Here's what you do. Go to rtwoffer.com. Or call us at 1-888-218-9337. That's RTW Offer. Of course, as I mentioned, all one word. RTWOffer.com. Or pick up the phone and call us at 1-888-218-9337. You can write to us at Running to Win... 1635 North LaSalle Boulevard, Chicago, Illinois, 60614. The Christmas carols tell us of a host of angels appearing over the birthplace of Jesus. Angels are messengers, and this appearance marked the greatest message ever told, that unto you is born a Savior. 
Next time on Running to Win, join us as we relive a blaze of light over the small town of Bethlehem. Running to Win is sponsored by the Moody Church.